Um, welcome back. Uh, welcome to our session. Um, uh, for those of you who weren't here earlier on, my name's Scott. I'm a Chief Strategy Officer of the Alliance for Water Stewardship. Um, so, welcome. Um, our session is co-hosted with UNICEF and WaterAid. Um, I'll be giving some opening remarks on behalf of Wash for Work. Thereafter, I'll hand over to George from UNICEF and Mylan from WaterAid. Some of you may remember Mylan from her previous tenure at the Seal Water Mandate and her helming of Wash for Work. So, welcome back, Mylan. Um, then, as we enter the session proper, um, Cheryl of Wash for Work uh, will outline the agenda. Um, I'm here alongside my colleague uh, Madhu from uh, the Coca-Cola Company. So we share the privilege of serving as the current co-chairs of Wash for Work. Um, so what are we? What is Wash for Work? Um, we're a membership initiative of the Seal Water Mandate. Um, our focus is equipping businesses with actionable strategies on water sanitation and hygiene. Uh, for anyone that's not yet a member of Wash for Work, more than happy to have a conversation at the end uh, over drinks. Um, so. The context for today, um, the global wash crisis remains severe. Um, I'm not going to repeat the statistics that you've probably heard already. Um, taking action is essential if we're going to meet SDG 6. Uh, governments are, of course, the ultimate duty bearers in relation to um, provision of uh, wash services. But businesses can also um, support. Businesses have a role to play. Um, so at Wash for Work, we know that companies who have been taking action on wash have built more resilient operations and workforces more resilient supply chains, better supply chain relationships, and better community relationships. Um, yeah, we also know that many companies gra uh, um, grapple with how to get started on this topic. So it's not a natural topic for businesses to engage in, in a way that the management of water is, in the sense that companies manage water internally, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this session will, I hope, um, help you with that. Um, we'll look to answer the following questions. So what are the drivers to act on water sanitation and hygiene? Um, what key steps should you face when embarking on WASH? Uh, what tools and guidance are available to you? And uh, also by, by definition, what is still needed? So what other um, uh, resources could WASH for Work help to provide? Um, and what does collective action on WASH involve? Um, we talked a lot about collective action ac across the weekend at Stockholm. It's sort of like there is a big wash dimension, arguably um, bigger in collective action. Um, and the final uh, part of that is what opportunities are there to engage now? So um, where, can you, where can you plug into things that already exist? Um, so our basic objectives is to guide you through what good wash involves, um, provide some context for why and how to act, to share some concrete examples of good practice. And our ultimate goal is to gain some new expressions of interest from you. Um, so thanks very much for your attendance and your participation. Uh, we hope that you find something useful from our session. And with that, I will hand over to George. Thank you, Scott. Hi, colleagues. Good afternoon. Oh, no. This is not a friendly crowd. Oh, no. <laughs> Good afternoon. Ah, you've got to encourage me. You've got to encourage me. <laughs> um, I'm glad to be here. Um, my name is George Laya J. I'm the director of the program group at UNICEF. And um, amongst the many programs that we have, um, I'm not saying because my WASH colleagues are here, <laughs> but WASH um, is close to me, is, is closest to me. Let me ask how many of you have taught a slum b b before? A very bad slum like Kibera or like the ones in Mumbai, or uh, how many of you? Uh -huh. How many of you have taught a, a slum by night? <laughs> okay. Okay. If I may, one more question, if I may. Okay. You know, I, I, I was in a meeting yesterday with uh, the president of S South Africa, and, and, and I used to work in his country, okay. So one day he came to us and he said, um, how can we reduce the number of deaths due to a child mm -hmm. dropping into a dash, dash, dash? Who knows that? A child is a child, isn't it? A child feels the urge to do something, isn't it? And the child goes to a place called a toilet, isn't it? And the child falls in there and dies there. 
So he came to us and said, oh, I mean, it's embarrassing we are supposed to be an upper middle income country, but it happens often in the Popo province. So I'm glad to be here, and especially if it's linked to climate change. Um, I'll talk about the, about the, about the main uh, project in Indonesia, but first, first a few thoughts. The more um, I travel around, the more I see that um, intervening through WASH gives us a solid answer. Um, you see, kids, kids and climate change is a broad issue. It's, it's a broad issue. There are health dimensions, there are education dimensions, there are, you're looking for a tangible dimension. And that is WASH. And again, I'm not saying it because Aiden and, and Anna are here. But we are seeing the impact of climate change on, on communities in a way that we've not seen before, on low-lying slum areas. A, a lot of slum areas are low-lying because they cannot afford the land in the real parts of the city, so, so they stay there. And we are seeing the impact of climate change on coastal communities. I come from a coastal village, and all of a sudden the government has to look for money to er er erect a sea defense wall. Um, what, does to, what that does to our water systems, our sanitation systems, is immense. And we know that as, 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 we, as we act, there's a city in New York, I'm not, in the States, I'm not going to mention, but when it became very hot a few weeks ago, the mayor de decided to, to uh, float a swimming pool so people could just go and lie in it. I said, oh my goodness. Um, but for many parts of the developing world, it's a matter of life and death. It means girls have to work longer to find water. So it means they are in school, they go to school late, or they drop out of school. It means san sanitation systems are compromised. When there's a flood all of a sudden, and your, and your system is the, is the old type, it, it just contaminates um, um, the water, and it means, it means more waterborne diseases. So WASH and the climate crisis are, are very linked. Um, when it happened in Pakistan a couple of years ago, I'm sure you, you all remember, about a third of Pakistan was underwater. Um, um, I, I had to go around the country so I traveled from, if, if you know Pakistan, well, there's a, part, a, part, a, part, um, a place called Balochistan. It's near the border of Afghanistan. So I flew in there and I had to come by road to see the damage. Um, wells were underwater, toilets were underwater. Kids were just trying to hold on to what they had with their mothers. So the immediate impact is in terms of um, more waterborne diseases. So we are seeing more cases of cholera, for example. We are seeing more cases of typhoid, for example. All of a sudden, countries that had overcome these problems. And we are seeing huge, huge um, disruptions to livelihoods, to small businesses. So the case is a compelling one, and, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm talking to, the, to you, you know these things already. But it's not just the, the, the usual narrative about, about safeguarding health. It's about helping communities to improve their level of resilience, helping communities with, with a different way of, of putting in place the right infrastructure or service, and helping communities to cope when the bad day comes. With, with climate, we are seeing more bad days, more and more bad days the frequency is increasing. Um, to ensure that the school, you know, um, and again and again, one important dimension of, of schooling, especially high school education, is that you, the, for, for especially girls, if the bathrooms are not there, they can't go to school, okay? With with climate, we are seeing more and more of this happen. I, I could tell you a story about what I saw in, in, in Bangladesh. Um, but I, 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 I guess I'll skip that because of time. 
uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll be done soon. I could tell many stories, but I could, I'll be done soon. In, in UNICEF, we, are, we believe we are leading the way in developing and implementing climate-resilient wash solutions. And we are doing so with some of you in this room. So thank you for that. From understanding and managing the risks to taking action, con constructing flood-resilient latrines or toilets, establishing early warning systems, creating solar-powered water schemes, and reducing emissions by stiffly managed sanitation. If, if there's one thing that I, I truly appreciate from my WASH colleagues, is that we've been a lead player in, 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 in making the case about um, between emissions and, and, and st stiffly managed st sanitation. Our target is to help communities become more resilient. Over the, over the past four years, we've managed to help some 20 million plus people have access to climate resilient water services. And we have installed almost 9,000 solar powered water systems across some 68 countries. We have worked with over 50 countries to improve their policies and their systems. So we kind of feel we have skin in the game here. We kind of feel that if it's about the child, we want to be part of your networks more and more. We want to be part of the journey more and more. We have skin in the game. For some communities, it's, it's, it's the, the, the uh, having their services wiped out without our uh, interventions. So today, we're excited to introduce a new initiative. We call it the Collective Action for Golden Indonesia 2045. Together with CEO Water Mandate, UNICEF is inviting companies and business leaders in Indonesia to champion addressing water challenges in the Java Basin. This effort will bring us together to implement innovative wash solutions to over 3 million people, tailored to the challenges posed by climate in Indonesia. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Java Basin and why it is of utmost importance that um, we, we come together to invest there. The collective action underscores massive value of partnerships, shared value partnerships. When we come together, we are we, we, we able to innovate, we are able to push the boundary, we are able to test um, new s solutions, and, and we are able to help solve um, problems. By pulling our resources, expertise, and influence, we can create a multiplier effect that exceeds individual efforts. UNICEF is uniquely positioned to help facilitate these collaborations. We've worked qu quite a bit with governments and we believe that we are able to facilitate um, difficult conversations, hard negotiations um, between governments and other partners, between governments and businesses and so on. We have the, lo the knowledge the local knowledge. Incidentally, when I was working here, my two colleagues who, are, who, who, who came with me, they both in, in their career served in Indonesia. I don't know, I don't, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> but we've all had to serve um, in, in, in many parts of the world. And we have established relationships and friendships. Um, lastly, we have the operational capacity to drive change. That's my job, to ensure that change happens, results happen, Impact happens, value for money happens, solutions work. The potential to scale up and replicate most, more actions is immense. We envision a future where climate resilience wash initi initiatives are not the exception. In some parts of the world, we see expansion, but in some par parts of the world, the, there's a lot of scope for, for, for expansion. We, we would like to see every community, no matter how remote or vulnerable, having access to safe water and sanitation that can withstand the impacts of climate change. So to you, our partners, if I may, your role in this journey is indispensable. It must happen. Your innovation is what we need. Your dynamism, your entrepreneurship, your drive is what we need to crack it. 
we need to increase our impact. So we need your commitment and a bit of your resources. And together, we can build a world where every child can grow healthy, educated, and resilient to the impacts of climate change. So thank you very much. Um, you are in a good sector, a sector that has impact, a sector that saves lives, a sector that brings dignity to people. If you have a safe toilet, you have dignity. If you drink uh, clean water, you feel good, you feel empowered. So I thank you for your partnership, and, and I, I look forward to working some more with many of you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Last session before we go get to the one of reception. So we'll try to keep this brief and exciting, right, as we move forward. First, I really, I really am really excited, right, as we think about how we actually achieve the outcomes we want to achieve to the, to the mandates, the WRCs, for faster initiatives, getting actually change in those 100 basins requires this cross collaboration, which has been a theme, right, for a, a lot of the conversations we're having now, and really pleased that we're able to do this with UNICEF, with WASH of Work, and with many of you in the room around this critical aspect around WASH um, for people. If we kind of look back the 10 years, we go back a decade ago, where was WASH in this conversation? Where were we in terms of what we did? If we look at it, many of you were approaching this from a philanthropic angle, from grant funding, from looking at it as let's just do it as a nice to have. We had the human right to water and sanitation adopted about a decade ago. We had some of the guidance around what does that mean for businesses as we move forward on this. And then we started to see movement, right? We saw kind of WASH become one of the pillars for Reliance for Water Stewardship, one of the key outcomes for that that many of you are utilizing. We saw it now from conversations uh, at the mandate had related to net positive water impact as a third pillar, a critical pillar, uh, along with the critical environmental issues that we're all facing now. So it is, what does that mean? Where do we go from, from here, right? We know, right, from the business case, as Scott mentioned, WaterAid and, 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 and a number of partners have laid out the very clear reasons for why we can, should invest in WASH. The absence of, uh, the low absenteeism, increased productivity for employees. The fact that man, in many of these cases, you have a very clear return on investments of at least $6 to for every dollar invested. We have the fact that we look at from the risk side of the equation, CDP found, for that from the risk side, uh, at least 10 of the major global companies have seen at least $6 billion of, of assets at risk from WASH specifically. WaterAid has been, been also been working with Racket and Valuing Impact in terms of we have the business case for companies inside, inside, inside their factories. We have the business risk side of equation. What does this mean for society? And we, what we found is that in many of the cases, for every dollar invested by companies in basin, the social returns on investment in those basins are equally high, at least $6 for all investments. So the business case is there. Right. The business case has been set out there for why companies can take actions addressing the risk aspects, the societal well-being aspects, the uh, return investments for companies aspects of this now. That's all been done from kind of, you know, where we come from, the voluntary space. What we're also seeing now is a very clear shift in the regulatory space of the equation, which we're going to speak to, my colleagues going to speak to this further today. The e European Union has passed, has passed a number of legislations on the CSRD, CSDD legislations that will require businesses to start to disclose on their risk and impacts on WASH in communities. To actually speak about how they're going to take the actions to understand their impacts on people, the risks that they're facing, and what they're doing to this. This is a fundamental change, and WASH is critical within this. If we're going to go into the seat to, to, sh to lay out where it is shown explicitly around and washing these places and implicitly, implicitly, very much tied to environmental impacts that companies have on what comes out in basins. So from the last decade, from the voluntary space, we've got a lot of movement. The regulatory space is gonna push this even further, and this is, this is this time to act now. The question is, how do we do so? And this is a conversation Cheryl and I have been having, right, in terms of do we have the right tools and resources out there? Do we know how to actually integrate this into core sustainability strategies for operations for supply chains across for, for companies overall? And we're gonna ask you, Right? We're going to build out, we're looking to build out what we're calling a corporate wash roadmap. The question is, where do we see things working? What do we know that's working and helpful for companies? Where do you see there's major gaps? What tools do we really need to develop to address those gaps? How do we integrate the climate resiliency aspects, the gender equity aspects, in terms of how companies approach wash overall? 
And these are kind of critical as we move forward. We're also gonna lay out here on, on a session today where there's really innovative, I think, kind of the scalable uh, collaborations in basins. I think, George, thank you for, for talking about the in, in, Indonesian one. We have so many more now that's gonna combine the wash, the watch security aspect of it in a way that we haven't, so, so it goes beyond just a nice to have to a fundamental change in a scale that's needed to talk, tackle this system systemically. So what I ask you all today as we move forward in, in the next segments is to lean in, help us answer those questions, see where things have worked, see where there are opportunities, and move this really agenda forward more quickly than we need to today, given the challenges that we're facing. Thank you. With those um, compelling remarks about the business case for WASH in, in 2024, which is which is changing, we heard from from UNICEF about um, the impacts of climate um, on WASH, and we see the reports from UNICEF and the Joint uh, Monitoring Program on uh, on WASH that uh, that the numbers are, are getting worse in many cases because of, of climate change, um, and so even even more imperative to act. Um, and from from WaterAid, the the financial case um, is getting stronger. The social case um, is getting stronger, and we now have a regulatory case um, as well, which we'll, we'll hear more about um, in the session today. Um, for those of you that are, are not familiar with, with Wash for Work, um, our co-chair, um, uh, Scott McCready, who spoke, I'd like to just point out our other co-chair, um, Madhu Rajesh from, from Coca-Cola, bringing together, um, which Wash for Work is, is a, is a network bringing together companies um, who have been showing leadership on Wash, companies that have signed the Wash pledge, or a similar public commitment um, to action on Wash, together with our global um, Wash stakeholder community, the experts on, um, on how we advance leading practice um, on WASH. So if you haven't been familiar with the WASH for Work Network, um, uh, as Scott said, we hope you, you come and join us. Um, to move into the next portion of our, of our program, um, we're going to hear from uh, colleagues that, um, that are, are setting the scene for, um, for what good WASH looks like in 2024 um, and beyond. We want this to be interactive. George challenged us to, uh, and Mylan challenged us at the end of the day to bring energy. So we're going to get you talking to each other um, in just a moment. Um, but to kick that off, um, we're often asked really about what do we need to do as companies? Um, what is the expectation on us um, regarding WASH? in 2024, and we have distilled this down into a couple of things if you have to take it at a high level. Number one, has your company done a WASH risk assessment in the last three years? And if you haven't um, done a, a WASH risk assessment in the past three years, it probably hasn't included climate risk, um, which we've just heard the importance of. So revisit your WASH um, risk assessment um, in the context of climate risk um, having impact on, on WASH services for your workers, uh, supply chains, and in communities uh, where you operate. Then once you've done that risk assessment, have you set priorities for action um, for, for your company? And are those actions prioritized to, um, to basins of interest where you could work together with other companies in collective action, as we just heard from our, our colleagues um, earlier? And finally, um, are you uh, measuring and reporting on uh, the impact that you're having with these investments um, that you're making in WASH? And we, we now have a new framework um, for, uh, for standardizing and, uh, and reporting on the multiple benefits of, of WASH, as you've heard uh, earlier today um, from, from Greg Brill um, in our net positive water impact um, discussion, and you'll hear more about today. So at a high level, what is expected of companies on WASH in 2024? If you can answer those five questions, you're doing really well. <laughs> if you'd like support on those five questions, that's what the Wash for Work initiative hosted by the CEO Water Mandate is here to, to support on. Um, I'd like to now invite up our next group of colleagues uh, to take us through the program. Um, Tara Padmore from, from WaterAid and uh, Laura Weinberg from, uh, from Limnotech. If you could approach the stage. And Tara, we're gonna hand it over to you to take us through the new work happening on the corporate WASH roadmap. Good evening, everyone. I think we've heard really quite eloquently um, already the why. Why should we care about WASH as a absolute need, but also why from a business perspective and probably more pertinent to you all in this room, why you should care. Why you should care about WASH as a matter of business resilience, as a supply chain continuity issue, but also as a climate resilience issue. So I wanna shift the conversation a little bit on from the why onto the what, right? What do we mean when we say good corporate wash or wash stewardship as we're kind of coining now? 
and how on earth do you go about it? Um, so to do so, let's move on quickly, I think it's important to kind of take stock of the context that we're operating in with respect to businesses and WASH. We're seeing more and more an increasing expectation of the private sector to be acting on WASH. This is not only in your own, own operations, but also in your supply chains. And that creates an interesting dynamic around what you have control over, your owned operations, but also what and who and how you can influence. And that takes you into your suppliers, that takes you into your, the community surrounding your owned operations or your supply chains, that also takes you into advocacy and policy change. So there's a lot happening and a lot of expectation around the private sector with respect to these different elements. We're also seeing a shift from a risk perspective to a more holistic and proactive approach based around re re sorry, resilience as um, grounded very much in that, that idea of climate resilience. And then, as we've heard throughout the day, looking beyond the individual into the collective, into your collective responsibilities, but also your cumulative impacts, especially when we're talking about hotspots, the likes of, for example, the apparel industry in Dhaka or in Nigeria, where we're seeing some 70% of businesses actually in Lagos itself. We're also seeing a bridging of the environmental and the social silos that have long existed and arguably do exist now. And we in the WASH community have known this for a while. WASH sits at kind of the crux of both. Um, but more and more, I think businesses are taking note that we can't just look at these as discrete arenas, that the environmental impacts the social and vice versa. And in order to prevent any unintended consequences, we need to be opening the channels between the two. And then lastly, as Mylan um, uh, referenced earlier, the changing regulatory landscape, mainly um, led by CSRD and CSDDD in the EU. WaterAid's just in the, in the midst of conducting a pretty in-depth study into CSRD and CSDDD to understand where exactly WASH sits within these, what's the opportunity for driving WASH action, but also what are the risks, right? Is, what are the risks that we're facing through this new regulatory landscape? We're seeing that wa water and sanitation is definitely in the regulation, which is a huge step forward. It's the first time it's been mandatory to be looking at how you do these things through CSDDD um, and how you're disclosing about it. We do know that hygiene is unfortunately quite absent in that. And water and sanitation largely sits on the social pillars of CSRD, the S2, affected communities, S3, um, effect, sorry, S3, affected communities, S2, workers in your value chain. This is great. There's also a lot of implicit references to WASH um, through the likes of gender equality, adequate housing, worker health and safety, and environmental degradation. This is a really big opportunity for WASH to get WASH up the agenda, and it's starting to shape that what question of what does good corporate WASH look like? Now we have the bare minimum outlined here for you that you all have to do. Um, for us, that's a really great step forward, but I think it's also a really big opportunity for businesses to be demonstrating how investments in WASH can also contribute to your other social and environmental goals, whether it be gender equality, whether it be worker well-being, environmental stewardship, climate resilience, and the likes. We also know that the directives are bridging that environmental and social divide. In CSRD and CSDDD, right now WASH is largely sitting directly under the human rights and social elements, but it is also indirectly referenced under the environmental pillars. This is again a really big step forward in bridging those silos, but what we know from the interviews that we conducted through this study with businesses, many of whom are in the room today, is that the actual practicalities of doing that is a little bit more complex, it's, it's trickier, and there's limited guidance around that. So we know there's gaps, we know there's some risks as well. Um, there's also no, for example, there's no metrics prescribed for how do you um, assess and, and measure WASH within the regulation. Data assurance is a, a considerable issue as well. And we know generally because WASH is generally implicitly referenced, perhaps more strongly than explicitly referenced in the regulations, that if the private sector does not have the capacity, or sorry, the, the understanding, the knowledge, to identify the links between WASH and, for example, gender equality, WASH and worker well-being, WASH and environmental degradation, that it's at risk of being overlooked. Um, and, and we, as a result, would not be able to leverage this opportunity that the regulation is presenting. So we're getting a little bit of the what and a little bit of the how through the CSDDD of good corporate WASH stewardship. Um, but we often still get asked, the corporates um, more recently have been coming to WaterAid saying CSRD, CSDDD is on my doorstep. How do I conduct uh, impact assessment in my value chain? I know WASH is material, can you help us? And so there is a need. 
We do also know that there is also a lot already existing. So you can see across the environmental side, mainly the water stewardship side, and the human rights side as well, that there's a lot of guidance, there's tools, there's frameworks, there's resources, whatever you want to call them, they're there. There's a lot out there, but there's nothing really giving you that unifying thread to guide companies along the WASH journey. Whether you're a beginner starting out on WASH, not having a clue as to where to start, or you're uh, somebody who's already investing in WASH, but wants to keep advancing and, and bringing others along with you. And so that's the need we're trying to address. Water Aid and WASH for Work are collaborating to develop a corporate WASH roadmap and an accompanying toolbox. What we're not trying to do, and I'm sorry, that diagram's looking a bit, <laughs> it's not um, how I intended it to look, but what we are, <laughs> you get the idea, I hope. I promise it will look better in the final version. <laughs> <laughs> What we are trying to do is to support companies to integrate WASH into their existing environmental and social approaches. While, as Mylan mentioned, integrating the gender lens, integrating the climate lens, which are so critical and which many of the resources that we have now don't quite do as effectively as they should. What we're not trying to do is create another framework. We know there's a lot out there already um, and we're not trying to create an added burden. Um, in that not so nice diagram, you can see on the left hand side the, the five buckets and those for those who are familiar would be would recognize that it's very aligned to most of the existing frameworks that are out there, the Act D especially. And we're not trying, and so we're not trying to cre recreate the real, we're just trying to get WASH into the areas it should be. So we can't do this alone. Um, we have the WASH expertise, but you all have the practical know how of what feasible, what's um, reasonable to ask as well. And so we really are relying on you to help us. Um, we want this to appeal to companies at the beginner level, those who are just starting out and don't know how to set a wash target, to those who are doing wash every day, but want to bring others along or want to enhance what they're doing already. So my kind of call to action to close is to ask you to join us, help us know what to prioritize first, um, help us know what's, what's working, what's not working, what you've done already and what you've found successful so that we can integrate it into. We are um, starting launching an advisory group to support this work and we'd really, really value the voices of you all in the room to support this. Um, so please reach out to any of the water aiders in the room or the Wash for Work team as well. We'll put your name on the list um, and get this work started. Thank you. Right. So some really great comments from George about um, inspiring us moving towards impact when it comes to WASH. My lawn focusing on where we've transpired over the last 10 years where WASH is now linked more strongly with these other water stewardship themes of volume, of quality, of um, the socioeconomic imp impacts. And as Tara just said, it's a complex world and we need to be able to understand the benefits that these WASH investments can provide. So um, I wanna just do a very quick overview of a framework that, that um, Cheryl mentioned earlier. Um, it's the WASH Benefits Accounting Framework that's been under development for several years. It was formally released in June uh, back at the AWS Forum. And why was this done? First of all, to help make the business case for why are WASH projects important and valuable for an organization. Secondly, how can we address fragmentation of how you might account for benefits of the, the large menu of different types of WASH projects that are out there? And then thirdly, how can we move beyond simply counting the beneficiaries of a single project, but looking at deeper layers of outcomes and impacts? So um, again, this framework is out here. There's two components to it. There's a link there where you can get to both reports. The summer report is really focused for water stewardship leads of an organization and even further up the, the, leadership, um, the leadership levels. And the second report is the methods, which is much more detailed, and I'm gonna give you a quick uh, peek at that. And that's really meant for practitioners and also project implementers. All right, so in water stewardship, there's this is the impact pathway that we often see for volumetric projects, other types of projects, and this framework uses the same approach to really characterize how would you quantify the benefits of a project. And the impact pathway always starts with, um, first of all, what is the need, and then what are the inputs to, to generate um, this action on the ground? What are those specific activities that are put in place? And then typically a key step is what are the measurable outputs that can be um, quantified through an accounting step. And this is where we might, for WASH situations, look at like a number of beneficiaries. What this work does is it takes us further down that pathway towards outcomes and impacts, and it provides um, a more detailed set of indicators and methods to quantify these benefits at a higher level. 
This is a very brief summary of some of the um, specific benefits that are um, applied in this methodology. And this ties in with some of the conversations we were just having. What are those additional socioeconomic impacts that a WASH project might provide? For example, it could be improving health and well-being. It could be improving educational opportunities, as George mentioned, with girls now having the opportunity to stay longer in school and, and extend their education. It could be environmental impacts focused on water quality, also focused on climate adaptation. That's something we've already heard about today and the importance of that. It could be institutional um, impacts as well, such as um, water governance improvement, increasing property value and land value, and also a very key theme we've heard about is financial investment, um, return on investment. So these are the, the benefits, and then what this um, project, or this accounting framework allows us to do is look at the specific indicators and methods to, to quantify those. The methodology also includes a, a very logical process to follow. Um, the first thing is to understand water risks, or I'm sorry, wash related risks. As Cheryl mentioned, something all companies should be thinking about um, on a regular basis and, and also thinking about the climate related impacts. So understanding the risks, defining specific wash project goals and activities, finding those partners to implement, selecting then the appropriate wash benefits, indicators and methods to realize that you wanna be able to quantify those benefits after that WASH project activity has been in the ground. And then finally, what are the data and um, data collection that should be done to accurately calculate those benefits? So the detailed guidance provides a lot more information on this. Um, it's not a long report, but there's a lot of good detailed information. It helps categorize these activities, again, shares the specific indicators and methods, and recommends some best practices for collecting that data so that's known up front before the project is implemented. This is a very simplified hypothetical example of the impact pathway that I showed a minute ago and how that might play out <coughs> for some of the core indicators in the WASH benefit accounting framework. So first we think of a shared water challenge that might be uh, limited access to safe drinking water in a community. The inputs that would happen to help make, to improve that shared water challenge would be capital investment as well as engagement with community organizations. The on-the-ground activities would then be groundwater well construction and maintenance, as well as some forming some um, training and education of water, water groups in the region. And then typically what's been reported prior to this framework has been at the output step, which might be the volume provided to that community, and then perhaps the number of people trained or educated in these WASH-related activities. But what we're now doing is we're able to push it a little further down that pathway, and we can also quantify in a, in a um, consistent way the reduced time spent on water access activities, as well as increased proportion of um, positions in WASH management and leadership that are, are now led by women. So um, this is just a snapshot. I wanna, there's, there's a really a menu of different indicators and it's gonna be different for every project, different for every company, what you would wanna select from that menu to best quantify the benefits that, that are really best suited for your program, for your region. Um, but again, that, the guidance will, will give you a lot more detail on that. So my last slide, um, we're gonna do some Q&A tables in a minute and um, some breakouts. I'll be at a table focused on the benefits frame, accounting framework. I'd welcome you to come sit with me and learn a little bit more. Um, also, if you have um, applied, what we're called to action is to think about applying the framework to some of the WASH projects in your portfolio or some that you may have coming, coming down the pike. Feel free to contact me or my colleague, Nate Jacobson, who's lead author on the work, and I'm happy to connect you with him. And there is an upcoming webinar, I think the date is TBD, October, okay, thanks Cheryl, that we'll be sharing a little bit more on specific guidance for this accounting framework, so thank you. Um, thank you to um, to our speakers talking about the latest tools that we have in our in our wash um, uh, corporate wash stewardship toolbox. And uh, as Laura um, said, um, we will have the opportunity for Q and A with all of the speakers that you've that you've heard from um, at breakout tables, which will happen after this panel. So stick around for that. Um, our, our next panel is, uh, is to share some uh, really exciting developments um, in, in WASH um, uh, for us, which is really um, leveraging the collaborative model uh, we heard about this morning um, for collective action for WASH. And, um, and taking on the learnings um, from our, uh, our uh, multiple collective actions in, in place and applying them to WASH, um, we've been able to work with uh, many of our partners um, to, to look at where are their WASH programs that are ready for significant scale that could benefit from multiple companies coming together. And this is the result. Um, we now have um, four really exciting uh, WASH collective actions that happen to span the geographies that are most urgent um, for WASH. Um, India, 
um, with, uh, with, with WaterAid um, and several companies already. Um, Indonesia um, with UNICEF, we heard a little teaser um, earlier from George. Um, Nigeria um, with, with WaterAid um, and potentially Cambodia uh, on deck as well. Um, and Bangladesh um, with water and sanitation uh, for the urban poor. So I'd like to invite um, all of our uh, partner representatives up here to the stage and we'll, we'll hear from them um, a teaser about their initiatives and then we're going to break out to, um, to tables for, for Q&A where you can ask each initiative uh, any questions. Great. No, from here, yeah. Okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So Sarah and I are going to do this jointly because we're going to lay out kind of how we're starting to think about kind of the water aid wash collective action portfolio, if you will. And this is something that we've been kind of thinking about, right, in terms of how do we evolve the wash collective actions to be more impactful overall? How do we look at the different dimensions um, from, from getting to the scale that we needed? So uh, we're going to lay out kind of three el different elements. Each of them are starting to lay to, we'll, we'll, we'll highlight some critical differences and how it is that this has actually been a change in terms of how water is looking at bringing in more partners, looking at the different dimensions of how you start to tackle the issues, bringing in some of the aspects that, that, um, that was started the conversation with WWF, right, about bringing the community together, about just not talking about just bilateral, bilateral relationships with one-on-one -on -one with water aid, with a company, but WWF, with water aid, with groups of companies to tackle the multiple dimensions that will really need to be tackled in order to actually address the holistic issue at hand. So I'm gonna, as we're gonna start to weave that into conversation as we can kind of lay out these three opportunities, if you will. Sarah. Do both of these work? Can you guys hear me? Probably very loudly. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the Women in Water Collaborative in India. Many of you have already heard about it, uh, but I love to just keep talking about it because it's a wonderful program. Uh, started with GAP, um, and it's now a partnership that includes GSK, Cargill, Levi's, and other corporates are joining. You don't wanna be left out of this one. So uh, what is it? Um, it's, as I just said, it's a multi-industry partnership, um, climate resilient wash initiative. We're building on a six-year partnership that GAP Inc. had with USAID that reached 2.4 million people in India. The initial goal for the two-year launch phase is to reach 150,000 people with access to improve water and sanitation services in two river basins. That's the God Godavari and the Krishna. The long-term ambition, though, is to reach 5 million people in three river basins. We can't reach 5 million people if we don't have more corporates join, because it takes money to reach the people. Um, <clears throat> We're also expanding to the Ganga River Basin. Uh, these are the areas that we're working in. Um, I've just mentioned the river basins, the states, um, and this has been going on for a year so far. It's a seven year program. Uh, some of the achievements are that we've, in the first year, you're really building the foundation for any program. So you're doing assessments, we've trained women leadership groups, we're setting the stage for the next year wh where we will be installing water systems, sanitation systems, and getting access to the community. So it's super exciting. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you just very, very briefly um, about what it means to do collective action. A year ago when we started this, companies weren't that into it right? Uh, it took a while to get them on board. Uh, everybody was talking about collective action, but not necessarily doing it. A year in, we see a lot more momentum. And so, uh, as others have said before, for those who are new in their water journey, are not so sure how it works, um, we can work with companies at all stages of their journey around collective action. Um, what have we learned about companies joining collective action projects. We've learned that there has to be internal advocacy for collective action at the company. If the company doesn't, isn't interested in collective action, they're not gonna join it. So there has to be some push at the company level. Um, companies have to be flexible about geographic priorities because if everybody is saying, I want you to work where my company is, collect 
collective action isn't going to happen, right? It can't just be me, me, me. It has to be us. Um, you know, it has to be clearly defined roles and responsibilities. Sounds obvious. We always talk about it, but it really has to be clear who's the project management office, what is the company's role, um, and who, who's implementing. Um, and we had a launch phase because we had to make it more uh, kind of bite size, more manageable initially. These are some of the lessons um, and Oops, I'm already going to the next slide. Um, wanted to share those because I think there's apprehension from certain companies about joining collective action projects. And we wanna say, yes, there's been learning. We're happy to share with others how we did it, how we set it up. Um, we're really ex excited about where we are to date. Over to you, Mylon. <coughs> Thanks, Sarah. So the second area where, where, where Cheryl mentioned is that we're starting a new program. Or building a new program in Lagos, if you will. It's, it's building off of a very long history that, that Watergate has had in Lagos. And if you're just looking at Lagos and the issues that we have at hand in, 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 in the state, it's one of the largest mega cities in the world. And if you just look at, just think about this, only 10% of the people in Lagos actually have access to municipal water supplies, 10% out of 22 million. The, the vast aspects in terms of the impacts on, of, and the use of surface water and groundwater is it's mind-boggling. Mind -boggling. We just had um, a, a conversation with the former secretary uh, and, and the governor of, of Lagos in terms of the severe depletion in groundwater resources that's happening just because of the drilling of boreholes. Uh, because again, you've got 10% <laughs> attached to the, the municipal water supply in this place. Huge amounts of water impacts, water quality impacts, and this happens to be the economic driver, Nigeria. So that is what we're looking at, right, in one of the most severely impacted um, water crises places in the world, um, uh, a confluence of all the related issues. So what does this really require, and what is WaterAid kind of looking at, right, when we're looking at, 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 at Lagos and, and what we can do? We're taking kind of a three-pronged approach there that brings in a number of different elements of, of addressing the equation. I'm gonna go into a, a bit more on the Lagos Aqua Initiative, what we're gonna talk about today more specifically, which looks at building the capacity for wash services um, and the dimensions that that's, that's holding. But in Lagos as well, we're looking at this from an investment side of the equation. How do we bring in investors, connecting to the conversation that we just had in, in the last session, that brings in private capital um, and public capital in, in actually identifying the scalable, identifiable commercial investment projects, commercial ready projects, right, to, to do that? How do we do that, right? How do we bring in the additional capital needed? And then tying it all together at the end of the day is a lot of governance issues, the policy issues that have to be in place to enable corporates, right, to take the, the actions that needed in place to enable capital to flow into the country. So we've got the projects, wash projects on the ground, we've got the private capital aspects of it, the water security aspects of it, and the, and the, and the policy aspects of it that all have to come together in this place. So if we're looking at the Lagos Aqua Initiative, uh, again, uh, water aid has, has taken a number of dimensions. We're going to look at this from the water resilience, climate resilience and um, climate resilient wash and of the equation, the gender element of the equation. We're going to start to build like some core infrastructure elements of it. I won't go into it. You can see this here. But the two aspects of it of what we're focusing on is the more systemic aspect of it, of the strengthening the governance aspect for the wash capacity element of it, and to identify where it is that we're actually seeing the right wash models that can be scaled. So it's not just building the boreholes, it's not just doing this, but it's more the systemic approach to equation in partnership with governments and those entities in, in, in sector. So we're really quite excited about this and thank you to Diageo for spearheading this with us. We're really looking for others to come join us in this journey as we move this conversation forward to actually address this critical issue. So that's one of the governance aspect. I'm just gonna quickly touch upon, I mentioned this, we're working with WWF, right, and the Mekong as well, starting to progress an idea that would bring in the climate resiliency, the energy aspect, conservation aspects, bringing together the confluence of expertise to address this and in the Mekong. I'll just stop there. We'll take questions later. Thank you so much. Thanks, WaterAid, for a great presentation. And I am uh, going to talk about um, another country um, in um, East Asian Pacific, Indonesia. So I had the pleasure to uh, work there, as George mentioned earlier, for um, for almost five years as the as the UNICEF Wash Chief. Um, and uh, and Anne also is here, who you'll meet at the round table, um, who also worked there. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, you know how we work there and the opportunities. Um, incredible opportunities in Indonesia, 279 million people, 
Um, over 150 million of those live on the island of Java. There's another over 16,000 islands around Indonesia, archipelago, but um, of course we, we all know the, the, the famous um, tourist hotspots and um, you know the culture, amazing culture and food of Indonesia, but this also of course uh, depends on water resources. And, we're, and um, we can see that um, the water resources per capita of Indonesia is under threat. Um, Java, the island itself, um, there are studies which show extreme water scarcity coming by 2040. Um, the opportunities are, are huge in Indonesia. The, 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 we have an ambitious government. We have a government that wants to move the needle. Um, we have them investing in the sector. We have a stable economy that's growing. We have a vibrant population. We have 80 million young people in Indonesia. Um, and we have now the um, special envoy for water uh, joining us in the UN um, coming from Indonesia. So these are all great things. They're really showing their leadership also with a number of different um, initiatives and um, conferences that they've been leading on. But of course the challenges remain around poor access to safely managed services and the extreme climate risk which we've seen increase in the number of disasters that have been happening um, and increasing actually over the last 50 years. So Java is one of the 100 basins um, and we are um, also, um, as I mentioned, seeing the, the types of threats and risks that, that Java is facing. Um, but um, And it's, it's um, uh, a number of different climate hotspots have been uh, identified in central and east Java with uh, changing precipitation patterns um, due to climate change. So what we really want to do is to um, look at the opportunities in Java to, come to, to build this partnership across businesses and communities. Resilient communities need resilient businesses. Resilient businesses need resilient communities. And that's a little bit where um, UNICEF come in, in between. Um, we broker those partnerships. We leverage support from the government. Um, we bring uh, partners together and we have, um, uh, we're happy to talk about the modalities in the round table, but we really see this opportunity to reach 9 million people in, um, in Java with increased um, and improved resilient, uh, climate resilient wash services over the coming ye uh, years. And that's um, both directly, but also leveraging um, investments from all, it's all sector and all actors actually that need to come. We, it's not just public financing or private financing, it's also communities themselves who put the biggest investment into the wash sector. So we really have to um, see how do we um, make sure the communities and that the households themselves are getting the best bang for their buck. So the interventions would be around five different areas, um, climate resilient wash uh, interventions, um, the system strengthening, Water Aid really um, mentioned that in a nice way, how it's, um, it's not just about that reach, it's about bringing that to scale through, through government and, through, and getting quality out of government's investments. We often look at how much is government investing, but how much are they investing with impact and with sustainability is what we really need to be asking. Um, community engagement is critical to this. Um, we've seen um, very strong, vibrant community spirit in Indonesia. It's a highly decentralized context, governments at district level, not to mind province level. So um, you really have to, those critical decisions are being made right at that district level where we have to intervene and have boots on the ground. Wash for work, um, of course, that's what we're talking about here. We have amazing partnerships going on at the moment in Indonesia with Lixil, with Kimberly Clark, with others to um, really show that um, uh, common benefit for everyone. So moving quickly on, um, of course, um, what we do also want to do is to take the lessons learned and leverage, leverage upwards through um, the national planning systems, but bringing that down then with boots on the ground so that the systems and the policies aren't just um, theoretical, they're actually impacting on people's lives. So um, I hope that we can um, talk a little bit more together um, at the round table on this, and uh, we'll be happy to answer uh, questions on this and you know, show how that uh, actually together we can really create a vibrant partnership. As George mentioned earlier, it's not, this isn't an option. The climate change scenarios we're in, which is accelerating, is going to force us to force our hands. So let's be a little bit ahead of the curve on that. Let's be re proactively addressing the needs now rather than reactively addressing them when, they're, when we're running out of water. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I was going to say, um, I'm really pleased that um, George asked everybody um, who's been to a slum because, and most of you haven't, because most of your slides are pictures of the slums we're working in, in Bangladesh. So it, hopefully this will be new to you, but, um, and show you what it is. So 
Um, we are talking today about the work that WASAP does in, in Bangladesh that we really, really want to, to scale up. There is some, Bangladesh as a, as an, as a country has, has made some really big commitments to improving WASH and they're getting some really fantastic major investments from the World Bank and, and other IFIs into big infrastructure like sewage treatment plants and groundwater treatment plants, but it's not coming down to the, the community level. There's not that sort, there's a gap between these big fancy new implement uh, infrastructure and actually getting it down into the people in the low income communities who really need it. Um, and that's kind of the gap that, that you know, we, we're really interested in, in addressing it was that we are an implementing organization that specializes in, in providing water and sanitation and supporting the mandate holders in terms of the utilities to do that um, within, the, within the low income communities. And what we're looking at the moment particularly is in Chattagram or Chittagong if you, you call it that, where it's the second largest city in Bangladesh, it's the largest port, they're incredibly high, you know, rising sea levels, very high levels of, of water, uh, of salt and, and iron and arsenic and E. coli in the, um, in the water. And there's, it's also a big, it's a big manufacturing area. I mean, I'm sure some of you know that they have a lot of factories and um, export processing zones. And that's very much where we've been working. Um, next picture, it's just a picture. This is uh, the a entrance to a low income community. We just got out of the car, it had just stopped raining. That stagnant water stank. It was awful. It was just completely and utterly filthy. So we calculate, there's, there's not great um, uh, data in terms of all of the, uh, the census, but we calculate there are about 4 million people who live in the low income factory worker slums, that's the workers and their, their uh, families in Chattagram. This is a very standard area of Chattagram that has, well, that has a low income slum in it. Those are, families live in a single room. As you might imagine, everything is shared. There are no, there are no household uh, water, wash facilities. Sanitation, um, we, we will have a look at some uh, really appalling rudimentary pits, but if they have a pit latrine, it won't be emptied, it won't be lined, it'll overflow, there's nowhere to wash. I was walking through a, um, one of these slums, turned the corner and there was a small girl, completely naked, washing. Out in the middle of the slum, because there was nowhere else for her to go. It was just appalling, and the place is full of garbage and nobody actually wants to live this way and when you can't you having to go a long way for water either you put in a shallow tube well and you've got the risk of a high contamination or they're pay spending a lot of water a lot of money rather buying water from private vendors and again not knowing whether that's any good so we've been working in this uh, particular slums in working specifically with a factory um uh workers uh, since 2019, first of all, with support from the VF uh, Corporation and then with Coca-Cola Foundation, looking at providing toilet blocks. We raise them up out of floodwaters so the pits don't flood. And you, everyone's seen pictures of Bangladesh flooding. Well, half the time that's going to be the content of somebody's toilet. So let's not do that. We put wash basins near every single water block. The women are specifically, can we have somewhere to wash? So we built wash blocks for them. They are gender segregated. Actually, the wash blocks are women only. They have lights, they have locks, the toilets have lights, they have locks. Um, we put in metered water points so that people only pay for the amount of water they need, but also turn the tap off, because they don't otherwise. And because we work with the utilities and we work with the mandate holders, we've actually put a low income specialist unit into the, into the utility in Chattagram to help them understand better how to address the needs of the community. And what you can see down the second picture at the bottom, that's an unimproved toilet. Now, if we're talking about dignity and we're talking about safety, those are the kind of things we really want to address. So I'm going to run out of time, but I'll keep on going. Th these are the numbers that we've, we've delivered just through this. You can see them. We feel that they're really impressive and we can do so much more in this as well. You can see the picture, the bottom picture that this toilet has been raised up. But we've also, you know, we're doing, it's not just putting in the, the, um, the actual infrastructure itself. There's a lot of information and education we're doing with the communities as well to improve their health and their hygiene. And this is what they're telling us. Now, these women said they used to spend 700 to 1,000 taka a month buying water from a private vendor. Their share of the water bill now, they, they are connected to the, uh, this, uh, the, the utility, is 200 taka a month. They are saving an enormous amount of money specifically for themselves. The girls and women are healthier. They're not washing. They use rags for menstrual, um, menstrual pads. They're not using, they're not uh, 
uh, washing them in, in filthy water anymore. They're feeling healthier and wealthier. I'm just going to scoot very much through some pictures. Actually, they'll let me just show you this one. This one is, is, is really quite extraordinary. Private water vendor using a sponge to try and absorb some of the iron that comes out of the tap from a borehole. And then we have two cups. We have one, which is water, clean water, comes from sea water. The other one looks like a cup of tea. That's water out of a borehole. Nobody wants to drink that. So, and we also, this is, we put up a lot, lots of information in the, in the community and we put out um, leaflets as well. That poor young man was really thrilled when I asked him to hold up the leaflet, as you can tell. <laughs> so what are we trying to do with this collective action? Well, we, I mean, yes, there are four million people that we could reach, but we're starting off, maybe we're not being as ambitious as we could, but we're saying let's do two million. Um, yes, the same clean water points. Yes to the new sanitation, the new bathing, information and information on water stewardship and good menstrual health. But we're also now bringing in better, we're linking in, so we want to link in the sanitation services so that people can get their pits emptied on a regular basis. And we want to do some, uh, some work with them on, on, the, on the solid waste as well. And increase our support to the city authorities, to the, the utility, and to the other authorities around the, the, the factory zone so that they can better understand the needs of their communities. We are also, really importantly, we work with the communities. There's no point in putting in a water point or a sanitation block where no one wants it. So we, we ask them where they are. We use them to help construct so they understand them and they have this sense of ownership. And we, we train them in O&M so that they actually know how to fix things when they go wrong. Um, and we, you know, whether that's water quality, whether that's fixing uh, the tap or what have you, and we, we're connecting them through to the utility so that they understand their rights as a consumer. Because often they don't feel that they have any rights, they're not visible, and if they're a customer of a utility, we all know the power of a utility bill. It's really important. So I'll leave you with the words. Thank you very much indeed, Carlos, and thank you, Jens, for your lovely words of support for us. Um, and I hope that you are, those of you who are interested in, um, in Bangladesh, come and join us. Thank you.